Hello and welcome back to this series of short talks on DC motors. Today our conversation is about induced voltage and induced torque in the DC motor, but before that, a preamble. Faraday's law for motors. When a conductor cuts magnetic flux, a voltage appears along that conductor that is proportional to how much flux that conductor is cutting per second. In a motor, the magnetic flux, the conductor, and the velocity of the conductor are at 90 degrees to one another. The induced voltage, Faraday's law, becomes this very simple one. The induced voltage E in volts depends on the flux density B in Teslas in Weber's per square meter, on the length L in meters of the conductor inside the flux, and the velocity V in meters per second of that conductor. Electric forces, Lorentz forces. If a conductor that is carrying a current of I amps has a section of it of L meters inside a magnetic flux, and the flux density is B in Teslas, a force appears on that conductor that pushes that to one side. The field applies a lateral force on the conductor in our case, the conductor and the field are perpendicular to one another, and the force that appears is perpendicular to both and has a value in newtons, that is, B I L, Bill, flux density in Teslas, current in amps, and length of the conductor inside the field in meters. North pole, south pole, a convention. In a permanent magnet, we have agreed that magnetic flux lines come out of the North Pole with respect to the observer, and they sink into a South Pole. Now we move to this solid iron drum, in which we have cut two lengthwise slots, one on the top and one on the far side of the bottom. In those slots, we have installed a wire, an insulated wire down the top, an insulated wire at the bottom, and now we join them in the back, and we have one coil of one turn. Let's install that drum inside a magnetic circuit like this. Or better, let me make that transparent, like so. That drum is separated from the magnetic circuit because it's mounted on a shaft that is held by some bearings. The air gap here and there is what separates that drum from the magnetic circuit. We call that moving cylinder a rotor, and the static part of that machine to be, we call that the stator. Same as before, let me present you with a cross section of the whole array the magnetic circuit, the drum, and we have installed two coils F and S on the left-hand side of the magnetic circuit. That current IF in this one coil will create a magnetomotive force that will establish a flux given by the thumb in that right-hand rule. The fingers are the current, and the thumb is the magnetic flux, which indicates that from the point of view of the rotor, the top of that shoe is a north pole, and the bottom is a south pole. The radius of the drum is R, and we have carved and set a conductor on the top and another conductor on the bottom. Of course, those conductors are joined in the back to form a coil, as we have seen before. We pull out the wires on the top of that coil and connect them to an external battery, VT. RA represents the total resistance of the entire circuit. A current will flow IA. That current goes into the screen at the top and out of the screen at the bottom. But those currents and those conductors of a length L are inside a magnetic flux. This one is under a north pole. That flux will push to the left that conductor with a force F, and for symmetrical reasons will push the conductor on the bottom to the right with the same force F that is given by B I A L flux density, current, and length of the conductor, which is, of course, the length of the drum. 
That is the force. But the drum can rotate around its center, right? Around an axis, around a shaft. Then we have a torque. The torque applied to the drum is two times the radius multiplied by the force because we have two forces. Um, but that force is a BIL force. This is a torque. If we say instead of having one turn, why don't we wind n sub a turns? That way we multiply the whole torque by n a. Excellent. Allow me to write the flux density B as a total flux per pole, all of that divided by the area of half of that cylinder. And write that torque this way. Total flux per pole divided by the area of half a cylinder. And let me move all the factors that will not change to the left and consolidate them into a constant k. That k depends on the number of turns of the coil, on the radius of the drum, the length of the drum, and the area of half that cylinder. That induced torque then is proportional to the total flux per pole and to the current in that moving coil. That moving coil is called the armature. The armature current times k times the flux per pole. That is the induced torque. But once the torque appears, that rotor will start to move, to move at a velocity of omega radians per second. Once it rotates, the conductors will count the magnetic flux lines and the voltage will be induced in that coil, in that moving coil, in that armature coil. The induced voltage, of course, will be opposing, given Lenz law. That induced voltage is the flux density, the length of the conductor that is cutting flux, and the velocity of the conductor times 2 times the number of turns, of course, right? But the velocity, the linear velocity, is just omega r, the angular velocity in radians per second multiplied by the radius of that drum. Let's write b as a function of the total flux. Total flux divided by the area of half a cylinder and move into a constant, whatever does not change, and write that the induced voltage in that armature is going to be k5 omega in radians per second. K5 omega, that is the induced voltage in the armature. Coffee, anyone? I call these two formulas, just as in mnemotechnics, the coffee formulas, because both of them have the coffee term in front, K5. Induced voltage, K5 omega radians per second. Induced torque, K5 armature current in amps. You may be thinking, what is saying? When you have a moving coil that is rotating on the rotor connected to a stationary external battery, oh, those wires are going to be twisted into uselessness in no time at all. Not really, you see, because the engineers have done it this way. The coil is not connected to the external battery directly, no. That coil is connected to a moving divide called the commutator. On top of the shaft, the commutator has, in this case, two separate metallic segments to which the coil's heads are welded, are soldered, and on the outside the battery is connected to that commutator by sliding connectors that we call brushes. The coil rotates, but so does the commutator and the brushes that are sliding on the commutator keep the external battery connected to the moving coil. Here is a physical real commutator that has not two segments, but many. Because you see, in a real machine, instead of having only one set of slots and only one coil, we've said, why do that? Let's set up many different coils. Yeah, this way and this way and this way across the entire surface of that rotor and connect them to different segments of the commutator and then we connect all of those coils in series or in parallel 
to achieve whatever purpose we may want in terms of induced voltage and induced torque. What is this? This is the magnetic circuit in the center of which goes the rotor that I showed you in the previous slide. What you see up here is the F coil that has been split half at the top and half at the bottom. NF turns. In this drawing we have the field coil and the armature coil connected to a commutator of two segments. Here I have highlighted the brushes on the left and on the right connected to the commutator and then to the external battery. The formulas that we have seen today are the induced voltage, coffee omega, and the induced torque, coffee armature current. And that is all for now. Thank you very much and I hope to meet you again, my invisible friend, in our next video.